Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk on full resolution residual networks for semantic segmentation and street scenes. This is a joint work with my colleagues Alexander Hermans, Mathi Marcus Matthias, and Bastian Leibel from the Visual Computing Institute at RWTH. This work is about semantic segmentation, which is the task of su assigning one class label to each pixel in an image. And if we have a look at the previous research in this area so far, most approaches focused on using a pre-trained image classification network in order to address the unique requirements of semantic segmentation. And before we get into the technical stuff, let's have a look at these unique requirements. If we have an image and we want to do semantic segmentation, there are two tasks that we're trying to achieve simultaneously. One is what I would call object detection, meaning in this area of the image, there's a car. The other task that we're trying to achieve is boundary localization, which is, OK, this precise pixel is a car, and just, just the pixel next to it is street, maybe. And these two goals are competing. In order to do good object detection, you need a deep pooling hierarchy, a, a large receptor field, which is usually achieved using a deep pooling hierarchy. However, reducing the spatial resolution of the features deteriorates the features that you usually need for good uh, boundary localization. So in order to do semantic segmentation with an image, uh, image classification network, what you usually do is you use the classification network as an encoder, then get a decoder to come back to full image resolution. Usually, you add some long-range skip connections to propagate high-resolution features, and you may optionally add a, a COF post-processing step to in, uh, improve the performance around boundaries. What we do in this work is we wanted to start from scratch. We wanted to design a network architecture that specifically caters to the unique requirements of semantic segmentation. And for this, we turned to ResNets. This is how you usually uh, plot a ResNet, where you have conv conv convolutional blocks, and in between, you have skip connections. But you may also see this as having a processing lane, which is only updated using residuals. And our idea is, OK, let's have such a processing lane and keep it at the full image resolution, meaning we compute residuals at the full image resolution throughout the network. However, if we only did this, we wouldn't be able to achieve a large receptor field, which is required for good object detection and semantic segmentation. So we add another processing stream where we implement an encoder-decoder hierarchy. And this is what a full resolution residual network looks like. On the top, you have in blue the residual stream, which stays at the full image resolution. And in, on the bottom, you have the pooling stream, which implements the encoder decoder hierarchy in red. And the unique feature of this architecture is not that there are two streams. There are many architectures that have two streams. The unique feature is that the two streams are processed simultaneously using full resolution residual units. And this allows us to build up a rich semantic representation of the image at the full image, uh, at the full image resolution through, progressively throughout the network. And if we compare this to the uh, previously mentioned encoder-decoder hierarchy, we see that in the traditional view, you only achieve the full, re full resolution representation at the very last layers of the network, where you have to merge the, which, the, the semantically rich representations from the decoder with the very early features from the encoder. So let's have a look at these full resolution residual units. As I said, they process two streams simultaneously, what the residual stream and the pooling stream. And on the residual stream, as, I, as the name suggests, we operate like a residual network. And on the pooling stream, we operate like a normal sequential fee forward network. And when designing the units, we wanted to make sure that they're easily trainable, because we are not going to do image net pre-training, so uh, they better have a good gradient flow so we can train from scratch. And in the summary of the theory says, OK, if we may make the output on the residual stream a function of the output of, on the pooling stream, we will achieve good gradient flow, as we see later. There's also a more detailed derivation in the paper. So this is what a full resolution residual unit looks like on the inside. First, we reduce the spatial resolution of the residual features and concatenate them with the pooling features. Then we feed these concatenated features through two convolutional units consisting of a 3 by 3 convolution, a batch normalization layer, and a rectified linear unit. This already forms the output of the, uh, on the pooling stream, which is directly fed into the input of the next FRU on the pooling stream. In order to compute the full resolution residual, we add another 1 by 1 convolution and an unpooling stream. And if we have a look at the gradient flow under the assumption that gradients flow easily on the residual stream, we see that all the weights of the entire unit can make use of this strong gradient flow, even though we operate like a normal sequential free forward network on the pooling stream. In our paper, we use two network architectures that both follow the schematic that you see on the right. One is FRNA, standing for full resolution residual network A, and one is B. 
A has four pooling stages and B has five pooling stages. We use A mainly for comparative studies throughout the paper, whereas B will deliver the kind of benchmark performance that you will see later in the talk. So let's see how we do training. This is work about semantic segmentation and street scenes. So we train on the Cityscapes dataset where we have 5,000 densely annotated images split into training, validation, and testing. We train only on these on the training set, we do early stopping on the validation set, and the benchmark is computed on the private test set. We learn the weights of the network using what is called a bootstrap cross-entropy loss, which is due to Wu and others. And the idea is instead of computing the pixel-wise cross-entropy loss over the entire high-resolution image, just imagine an image of like 1,000 times 500 pixels, you only compute the loss over the k worst predictions. So if we set, let's say on the right, you see the, our current predictions of the network. If we set k to a small number, these would be the pixels that we compute the loss over. And if we increase k, we select progressively more and more pixels. And you usually select either pixels that are misclassified or for which the correct class is predicted with a low probability. And if you do uh, predictions at the full, at, uh, dense predictions, just consider using it. It's really good. So training details. We train on half-resolution cityscapes images due to memory requirements at a batch size of three, and we extend the data set uh, diversity using two times of augmentation, which is translation augmentation and brightness augmentation using random gamma corrections. We train in two stages. First, we tra train with Adam and a piecewise constant learning rate schedule, and then we fix the batch normalization statistics and fine-tune it with SGD and a very small learning rate. And one thing to consider with, if you have like this high resolution stream is memory requirements, specifically during training, not during inference. Because if you do backpropagation, you usually perform a forward pass, you store the entire forward pass in memory, and then you do a backward pass. However, if, you, if your tensors are so big that you, they no longer fit into GPU memory, you have a problem if you train only on a single GPU. So in order to train our network on a single Titan X GPU, what we did, we split the computation graph into several blocks. And then we perform a forward pass and just a backward pass for each block independently. This allows us to free the memory that we no longer need. And then we perform a second partial forward pass and then for the next block, the backward pass. This allows us to implement a kind of uh, space and time trade-off. So let's go to the evaluation. So before we go to the leaderboard, com let's compare it to a baseline. I mentioned earlier that the traditional approach is to just have an encoder and a decoder hierarchy uh, architecture with long-range skip connections. So we took our FRNA architecture. We replaced all the full resolution residual units with normal residual units and added long-range skip connections. And if we train from scratch on the four times subcenter cityscapes data set using the same hyperparameters, we achieve an absolute score that is 2.9% better meaning these two networks have the same receptive field and almost the same number of parameters, and the, our architecture allows us to generalize better and have a better uh, segmentation of the scene. So now let's have a look at the leaderboard. As I said, the, the, the test set is private, so there's a public leaderboard where you can check out all the approaches. The thick blue line indicates the state of the art from ECCV last year. And you see that we are able to match the state of the art performance. And we are the only one who can do so by, by only training on half-resolution images without pre-training, without training on the validation set, and without using uh, the course annotations that are also available, meaning our architecture is quite data efficient when it comes to training. And there are also two other papers here at CVPR uh, presented at poster session four and three, so go check them out as well. And we said we wanted to do well in terms of object detection and in terms of boundary lo localization. And the normal IOU score that, you, that we use on the leaderboard doesn't really penalize bad performance around boundaries. To, uh, so in order to score, quantitatively score the, our performance around boundaries, we did what is called a trimap evaluation, where you only evalu evaluate the predictions at pixels that are close to boundaries. Here on the x-axis, you see the width of the trimap, meaning what is the maximum radius from a boundary that we consider during evaluation. And on the y-axis, you see the uh, IOU score. And what you see, we outperform all other approaches. And not only that, we outperform also the uh, Laplacian pooling uh, approach, which is indicated by LRR-4x on the leaderboard, which is an architecture that uses a pre-trained network and is specifically geared to predicting high-resolution uh, segmentation masks. Finally, let's have a look at some qualitative results. 
This is a video where we predict the, each frame independently. And there are three things that you should pay attention to. One is notice the high resolution of the predicted segmentation masks. Two is uh, pay attention to the good boundary adherence, even, uh, yeah, pay attention to the good boundary adherence. And third, you will see that the flickering is pr more pronounced in some areas of the image than in others. This is just because there's a void class in the Cityscapes dataset. Everything that doesn't fit the within the 19 classes is labeled void, and the network will never learn to predict anything for these uh, areas. I will just let it play. It takes like 30 more seconds. Let's just sit here and enjoy. <laughs> yeah, you, the boundary localization is pretty good. You can see it also where we are able to pick up very small objects that are very far away from the camera, like traffic lights in the background and small poles. OK, in conclusion, this work is about high-resolution semantic segmentation with a very simple architecture. We're able to train from scratch to state-of-the-art performance, meaning we're very data efficient. And the entire architecture, the entire segmentation is processed on the GPU. There's no need for any pre- or post-processing. There's code available on GitHub. We, made, we make available pre-trained models for FRNA and FRNB, and as well as code for inference and training. So. If you have questions or want to chat, just come visit us at poster number 10. Thanks.